Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 82 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. We live in an age of information. Each morning I log into my Feedly account and I see over a thousand digital articles. No matter where I am, my smartphone vibrates with news alerts. When I log into my inbox, Google greets me with links to the day's top news stories. And then there's Twitter. I love Twitter and there's always news on Twitter. No matter where we turn, we have access to lots of information. But what do we do with all of this knowledge? How do we interpret the information we see and hear? And do we always use it in ways that will better our lives and interactions with friends, family, and neighbors? It turns out that we are not the first people to live in an age of information or wonder about what we should do with all of the knowledge we have access to. Today's guest will help us explore the world of the early American South and how Native Americans, Europeans, and enslaved African peoples acquired, used, and traded information. In essence, Alejandro Dubkovsky is going to take us through an early American age of information. During our conversation, Alejandro reveals details about the Native peoples who lived in the early American South prior to European arrival, when and how the Spanish established a settlement at San Agustin, Florida, and how understanding early American information networks can help us reconstruct how people in the early South lived and interacted with one another. But first, can you believe we're on episode 82? Time goes by fast when you're having fun, and we've had a lot of fun. But the fact that we're at episode 82 means we need to start planning episode 100. Because we're going to make this milestone, and this milestone in podcasting is huge. Because most shows never make it beyond episode 7. But we're going to episode 100 and beyond. So let's take time to celebrate. Members of the Ben Franklin's World community on Facebook seem to be of the mind that we should celebrate by having someone interview me, which means I need questions. What would you like to know about me, the show, or what aspect of early American history would you like me and our guest interviewer to chat about? Send your questions to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet them to me at Liz Covart, or join the Ben Franklin's World community on Facebook and post your questions there. You can join the community by visiting benfranklinsworld.com and clicking on the orange Join Now button on the home screen or by texting BFWorld to 33444. Okay, enough about the future. Let's get back to the past. Are you ready to travel through the early American age of information as it existed in the early South? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at Yale University. She studies the history of colonial America and has a particular interest in the early American South and its Spanish borderlands. Today, she joins us to discuss her first book, Informed Power, Communication in the Early American South. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Alejandro Dubkovsky. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We live in an age of information. We have access to news from different outlets such as the radio, television, print, and through the internet. We have so much information and different interpretations of that information that it seems difficult for us to process it all. Alejandra, you suggest that this is not a new problem. You explore the age of information that took place in the early American South during the 16th, 17th, and early 18th centuries. Would you provide us with an overview of what you mean by the early South? And would you tell us about the many peoples or groups that lived within the region? The early South is, of course, a label that I, as a historian, imposed on the region and a place and a time. Obviously, no one at that moment of time said, we live in the early South. Early from what time period? South from where? So these are, you know, terms that are all relative. But I imposed that upon a region and time so I could begin making sense of a really complicated area, a really complicated set of people. What I mean by the early South is sort of a region of the world that encompasses the present days of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and it spans all the way to the Mississippi River. And 
and in terms of the time period that I'm talking about, I begin in many ways my story as a historian with the beginning of sort of Spanish explorations in the in the 1500s. But truly, because the story pushes me so much back, I really have to begin way before the pre-Columbian era. In Cahokia is where I begin a little bit of my work, but truly as a historian, I begin in the 1500s and I trace the story to the mid 18th century. Big area in a long time period. And in terms of who lives there, the people I explore, I explore the Spanish, the French, and the English colonists, but a wide variety of native groups that inhabited the area. A lot of groups we recognize today, like the Creeks and the Cherokees, but also groups that are less well known today, like the Tumuqua, the Wale, the Apalachee, and also sort of the growing number of African slaves that are appearing in the mid 17th and 18th century. You mentioned Cahokia, or the Mound Settlement. From time to time, we see this settlement mentioned in newspaper, magazine articles, or even on television segments. Would you tell us about Cahokia? The first time I saw an image of Cahokia, I could not believe that was in present day United States. I thought I was looking at mounds in Mesoamerica, somewhere completely different. For people who don't know anything about it, it's this incredible sets of mounds that are gigantic that take your breath away when you climb them. And they were made by people between 900, but really in the 1200s to 1400. And it was a huge civilization that had 40,000 people. This is a huge space that they built gigantic mounds, that they farmed, that they had armies, that they had practiced complex forms of religion, complex forms of political structures. So the really complicated and sophisticated world that often we don't think of as being at the heart of North America, and it truly was. Well, that seems far away from the South we imagine of South Carolina or Georgia. In many ways, the reason I have to begin my story in Cahokia is because that moment, that organization model really serves as a way to influence the rest of the Mississippian societies that are going to come in its wake. So the things that are going to happen in the 1400s and 1500s before the Europeans are arriving are all shaped by this really dynamic native world that's taking shape beginning with Cahokia. So the reason why I started in Cahokia, although it's, it seems sort of physically far away, is because of its effects it has on this world that's really much evolving and shaping by the time Europeans arrive in the early South. And in terms of communication, which is how I'm thinking about this whole world and how it's connected, Cahokia, it's great because there's a lot more sources. And here I am talking about archaeology sources. But there's a lot because the site was so big and so many people lived in it and so many people left both architectural things they built or religious items or practice or trash that they left behind or ceremonial burials. So there's a lot of information about Cahokia. But what you also see is the influence that Cahokia had in other places. And since there's lots of people who work on Cahokia, rather than studying the site itself, I was more interested in to see how it was connected with other places. And that's actually, for me, one of the really exciting things about this world. It isn't that it's just big and sophisticated, but it's in fact that it has tentacles and it reaches to all these places, that it has the shells that are coming from the Gulf of Mexico, shirt coming from Missouri, it has all these connections. And also these places far away are being in contact with Cahokia. They're responding to it. They have to send tributaries to it. They send delegates to it. There's a big influence in this region. Wow. 900 to 1400? That's really early American history. Very early. I keep going back and back in time. My students joke I'm going to end up way too early. From your description and others I've read, I imagine Cahokia as a large city with many different trails going to and from it that connected Cahokia to other Native American settlements. Essentially, I imagine Cahokia as a large metropolitan Native American city. Is this an accurate image? I really think it was. And the important thing for me is not that it's just in center, but it's dynamic. So it grows very quickly. It has all these connections where people are going to Cahokia, taking material goods that they buy there, that they take back to their communities to show that they have connections to Cahokia. So it's not only strange items that are going into Cahokia. So Cahokian elites can say, look how far our power and influence reaches because we have these items from very far away. It's that people then going back to their communities are taking chunky stones made in Cahokia, are taking particular motifs that are being made from Cahokia itself back to show their connections to this great city. So yeah, definitely like a big center in which communities are all tied and connected to it. But it it also means that it controls a lot of power and in the sense that people have to go from Cahokia back to their community. They're not supposed to be connected necessarily to each other. They're supposed to be connected to the central node. But then that falls apart. Cahokia wanes very quickly, begins to fall apart. People begin to move out of Cahokia. There's lots of curiosity as to why that is around the mid-1400s where that all begins to fall apart. People talk about 
sort of an ecological crisis. Also talk about a huge spiritual crisis. People that had been building this mount suddenly find that the leaders no longer can support them, can support their interests, can balance the universe in a way that's profitable and sane for them. So you start seeing lots of this big centralized node where people were communicating to one particular hub all fall apart. And you start seeing much smaller connections, but many more of them starting to arise. So right at the moment you start getting European explorations, European invasions in the South is a moment where there isn't such a centralized information network. In fact, it's quite the opposite. You have lots of little nodes in play. So that, that makes it very hard. There isn't one central hub where everything's moving to. You have a huge diversification that's happening right at the time Ponce de Leon or the Spanish are, are making their way into the coast of Florida. Lots of people went to Cahokia to exchange goods. And with people comes information. What role did Cahokia play in Native American communications? Did the people of Cahokia gather and share information with other peoples? This is what I always want to know. What are they talking about? What do they want to know? So this becomes really hard, right? Because as a historian, what I want is written documents. And there are no written documents from Cahokia, but there are material documents. And there's also how to read information needs from things that have happened. For example, the development of palisades, the development of protection walls. Cahokia starts building bigger and bigger walls around its cities. The only reason to build these walls and cities is because violence is occurring. So what you start to begin to see is an increasing need to be informed about war and coming enemies. The other thing that seems like a very basic thing to sort of summarize and simplify, but it's what I can gather from the materials that's available. And the other one is the ability to distribute food, right? Because a lot of the way Cahokia centralizes its power is because it controls the grain. But that means it needs to be very aware of how the grain was, how much it was produced, how to distribute it appropriately. So I think both of these things, although, you know, I want to know much more about all these details, is what I can begin to glean about what Native groups, at least in this early moment in period, were concerned about and what they're communicating about. Earlier, you mentioned the Spanish. Would you tell us about their arrival in North America and their settlement at San Agustin? What did initial Spanish settlement look like and what goals did the Spaniards have for their colony? You know, the Spanish are early in the Americas and in the early in Florida. Ponce de Leon, who's uh, famously supposedly searching for the Fountain of Youth, he wasn't searching for the Fountain of Youth. He didn't find the Fountain of Youth, but he was there in 1513. This is before Cortes is in Mexico. This is before sort of the Aztecs are in the Spanish presence in at all. So Florida is really early in the early waves of Spanish exploration and conquest of the Americas. So the Spanish have known that there is what they call La Florida, but for a long time, they think it's an island. They're not entirely sure of its geography. So Ponce de Leon is there in 1513. He returns. There's a bigger expeditions that go in the 1540s. Hernando de Soto, Narvaez, who's more famous for Cabeza de Vaca's journey through it. These are all really earlier happening in the 1500s. And finally, it's in 1565 that the Spanish established the permanent settlement in San Agustin in St. Augustine, Florida. The idea, of course, is to establish a permanent hub. Florida has this key geographic location on the coast because it's really good for monitoring the ships that are sailing out of the Caribbean back to Europe, back to Spain. So this is a key strategic region. So it's there as an outpost. They're also there in theory to missionize even that early on. But the reality of that settlement in 1565 has more to do with the French than it has to do with any other grandiose Spanish imperial visions. When we think about early European settlements in North America, we often think about how Native Americans both helped make these settlements possible with food and assistance and resisted them with raids and attacks. Alejandra, what sorts of assistance or resistance did the Spanish meet from the Native American peoples who lived around San Agustin? One of the things that interests me as someone who's fascinated by how people communicate and how people know what they know about their world is how quickly Native people learn about the Spanish and who they are and what they plan to do or what these Native groups imagine the Spanish plan to do. In 1513, as I mentioned, when Ponce de Leon is in his first sailing voyage to Florida. Supposedly no Spaniard has been to Florida. He encounters a group of Indians, the Calusa Indians, that immediately attack him off the coast of Florida. And the reason they do this is because there are Native people in the Calusa community that have been fleeing the Spanish from Cuba and Hispaniola. So there's already Native people in Florida in 1513 that are already aware of Spanish intentions and Spanish plans for colonization. That's ridiculously early. 1513, you already have these things at play. So the Spanish, in, in some regards, 
starts encountering media opposition from Native people that are being informed from Native people in the Caribbean what's happening there. And in some other areas of Florida, they encounter a welcoming from groups that really see the Spanish as a tiny, tiny, tiny presence. I mean, we're talking about 200 Spaniards in a moment of time where the Tumuqua population or the other groups are in the hundreds of thousands. So the Spanish are truly entering a world that's Native majority in every sense of that word in terms of population, in terms of power, in terms of food, in terms of access to roads and the like. So really the Spanish need to tread very, very carefully. So some Native groups really see the Spanish as potential tributaries or allies they can tap into so they can fight their own wars or achieve their own goals that have nothing to do with Spanish plans or intentions in the region. So you see both of these things occurring from the earliest on both a welcoming and an attack. So there's no one strategy that Native people employ just because there's no one Native group in Florida. There's a whole slew of them. Resisted and welcomed. Do we have any idea how Native American peoples were sharing information about the Spanish? There's sort of words very early on in the 15 teens that Native groups from the Caribbean are traveling to Florida and telling them what's happening in Cuba and Hispaniola. In terms of by the 1560s, by the time the Spanish established a permanent hub in St. Augustine, there's a clear sense that Native groups all around sort of St. Augustine, Florida, have a some sense of who the Spanish are, how they travel, of um, what the Spanish seem to care about. One of the things that fascinates me is how Native people immediately know what the Spanish want. They say, oh, I know about you. You want gold. Okay, let me guide you to supposedly where there's gold. Even though that's the first meeting, in theory, that's the first moment of contact with the Spanish, Native people already have seemed to have learned this lesson of what is it that the Spanish are looking for. And this is coming from their contact with other Native groups or from people that are fleeing the Caribbean. So there's sort of a Native network that's at play here that's often hard to see when the Spanish are describing themselves as lost in the wilderness of Florida. In reality, they're walking through Native paths and existing through a Native space that's very much working, although they're lost in it. It's existing before for them. What about the Spanish? How did they acquire and use information about Native American peoples? Did they even speak native languages? That's a great question. I had written, I think, 75% of my book when I realized I was writing a book about communication and not thinking about language. So after a brief moment of panic, I uh, began thinking about how are the Spanish, how are they doing this? You know, how are they communicating? The Spanish have an immediate reaction to trying very hard to learn native languages, to learn, to use interpreters. Some of the earliest voyages, the voyages in the 1540s, which we think of as exploration or early conquest into the southeast, the Soto so it has interpreters already with him. Early Spanish ships are raiding the coasts of Florida, taking Native people as slaves. And these people are surviving these journeys. They're not immediately dying. They're not being killed. And they're returning back to Florida as interpreters. So the Spanish do have some interpreters early on, but they work very hard to learn the languages. I think this is in part what one of the most fascinating sources that is available for Spanish Florida is the amazing amount of Native language source material that's available, primarily in Tumuqua. And it's because Franciscans made a huge effort to try to convert people in their own languages. This is not by any means an easy process. It goes very slowly. I'm not saying that the Spanish are pros at trying to figure out what Native people want or gain information from them immediately, but the need to learn Native languages is something that the Spanish very quickly know that they need to do, and they start doing it almost immediately. In June 1564, we see another European player enter the early American South, the French. In 1564, the French established a settlement called Fort Caroline, which is near present-day Jacksonville, Florida. Alejandra, would you tell us about this early French settlement and why they established it? The French are actually there in 1562. They established Charles Fort. That all goes awry. They try again in 1564. These, again, are sort of a very tiny group of people that are establishing an outpost. It's tied to religious motivations. These are Huguenots. And it's also tried to early French imperial visions, trying to get in into this colonizing missions that are happening in the Caribbean and the Spanish are having these early successes in. This is the 1560s. By then, the Aztec Empire is supposedly under Spanish control. The riches of the Incas and the, the Aztec world is already being well known. So the need to get to the Americas is occurring all over Europe and the French are trying to get in this game. And like I've mentioned, Florida and the coast is a really strategic position to establish. So there's the religious element and there's also the strategic element that all of the vessels basically leaving from North America, from Mexico, from the Caribbean has to, in essence, pass through Florida to then get to open water back to Europe. So really controlling or having some outposts in that coast is really strategic. So the French set up a small settlement 
They're entirely dependent on their native allies. These would be the Tamuqua Indians. But the reason this is important, at least for the history of Florida, is how immediately the Spanish respond to the French fort there. It's one of those things that the Spanish had been trying since the 15 teens, had sent huge expeditions to Florida. I mean, Ponce de Leon is small, but Hernando de Soto has... 800 people or 600 people. These are huge expeditions. Luna has even more in the 1560s. So these are huge numbers of Europeans that are Spaniards that are going to Florida and just dying and failing miserably. And they're not finding gold. So Florida is not looking good. And it's not looking like it's going to be high on the Spanish priority list. And then the French set up shop there. And that is not okay for the Spanish. So the need to expel the French, the need to expel this potentially religious minority group that's a, quite a threat, right? This is a Protestant group. So a lot of what the Spanish write about Removing the Protestant weeds of La Florida is a big impetus for some of the Spanish leaders in 1565. So really, it's more than the settlement itself. It's the immediate Spanish response, not just to expel the French, but then to establish a permanent hold to prevent that from ever happening again, in theory, controlling the whole of North America. In Florida, that tiny little outpost was hardly going to be enough to do that, but at least it was going to be a step. It doesn't sound like the French and Spanish were sharing information with each other in La Florida. Did Native Americans use the French and Spanish rivalry to their advantage? They do. I mean, the French and the Spanish are not willingly sharing information. The Spanish are trying to figure out as much about the French as possible before they're going out there. There's a couple of people that have mutinied and have removed themselves from this French settlement that looks like it's going to fall to pieces very soon. So the Spanish have some intel from the rebellious French who have just given up on their project and have joined the Spanish momentarily. And so they have some information from the French themselves. But the French people, the French leader, Lorunier, knows that a Spanish retaliation is probably coming, but he doesn't have any information from the Spanish. They're not communicating with the Spanish in any sense. So he's really dependent on his native allies to tell him if they spot the Spanish, where they set up shop and what their actions are going to be. So the native nation that's set up in the middle of them, that these are the Tumuqua, plays a pivotal role in sort of figuring out how to balance the French and the Spanish that share the coastline for, again, a really brief moment of time. But for historians, this is really exciting because it produces documents for me, not just in Spanish, but also in French. I have two different accounts of sort of similar events and the native people that are in the middle of it. And it's a, kind of an old story of sort of playing different European sides of each other in order to get what they want. But really, the Tumuquas are trying to figure out who is going to be the better investment, you know, who's going to stick around and also who's not going to be the most intrusive, who's also going to let them keep control of their land and their space and is going to sort of be the most useful to them. And in many ways, it's understanding that Native story that's so pivotal because, as I mentioned early in thinking about Cahokia and this world that's diversifying and becoming less centralized, Tumuqua is exactly going through a crisis is going through a moment of time where its chiefs, its caciques are having to think of ways in order to retain their authority. So having a Spanish or a French power that's going to bolster their own particular individual leadership is going to be really instrumental. This is a moment of time where you see other groups sort of becoming even more and more fragmented. They're falling into smaller and smaller groups and the Tumuquas are trying to retain the hierarchical structure that has, you know, really close echoes to Cahokia, so really long tradition that's really being challenged by current present situations. And the Spanish come in at this moment. So Tumuquas are thinking, this will be Tumuqua chiefs, Tumuqua elites are thinking, this is a great ally we can tap into to retain our own particular sense of authority and power. So really, they're not just thinking who has the better goods or, you know, who's going to ultimately be the most powerful, but who can we employ that's going to help retain our sense of authority and power over our community. So it's a leadership structure is happening at this time. Your story is really interesting because when we think of Native Americans and the arrival of Europeans, we tend to think of Native Americans as victims, victims of European diseases, European war and European land hunger. But your story reveals that Native Americans weren't simply victims, that they had some power. When the Europeans arrived, they weren't exactly sharing information with each other, but Native Americans gathered information and they likely determined what information to share with Europeans and which Europeans to share it with. Yeah, I mean, with that caveat, being very careful, of course, having a lens of information, like any time a historian chooses a lens, you are choosing to see certain things and not others. The story of disease and violence is not absent from the story. Disease has a huge role in it, and it plays sort of a little later about when, you know, smallpox really decimates the Tumuqua population. But even when it does, they remain a majority over the tiny number of Spanish and the tiny number of French, and eventually the small number of early English people who are exploring this region in the 1600s. So really, native ability to communicate 
communicate to the Spanish about who the French are is instrumental to the Spanish figuring out where the French are, how armed they are, what their movements are going to be. And this was truly revelatory to me. It wasn't just that Native people were informing the Spanish about, you know, where certain waterways were or where certain food resources available were. They were telling the Spanish about the French. What the Spanish knew about other European powers came from Native people. And that was sort of a reshaping of my worldview. It wasn't that Native people were used as guides. They were used to learn about other European powers. So what happened to the French settlement at Fort Caroline? Well, there's this great fort called Fort Matanzas, which is not really far away from St. Augustine. You can sort of visit it today. I think it's a state park or a national park. And the name Matanzas means killings. So it's a horrible massacre. The Spanish killed the French. They even killed some of the French who surrender in this place called Fort Matanzas for killings. It's sort of a horribly bloody moment and it really sort of reveals the seriousness, the violent seriousness with which the Spanish are going to protect their hold on Florida. So it's not a really pretty story. The Spanish eliminated the French settlement in Florida, but in the 1660s, the English settled in present-day South Carolina. How did the presence of the English affect Spanish and Native American alliances and the flow of information? The English officially established Charleston in 1670, but before they're, you know, sort of reconnoitering the region. And actually, if you think about our early America chronology, I'm, I'm kind of missing Virginia here, right? 1607, Jamestown. So the Spanish are aware that the English are in Jamestown, and they actually have some early spy missions that go reconnoiter and some early native informants that go spy on the English in Virginia. And basically, the reports back are so discouraging about what the English are doing. They're basically saying these people are going to starve to death. There's no hope for them that the Spanish really relax about Virginia. They think this is a temporary thing that's not going to last at all. So they're not too worried. And also the Spanish had tried setting up missions in Virginia very briefly, and they are all killed. So they think if we can't do it, the English can't do it either. So it's really in the 1660s when English exploration becomes a little bit more serious in the Carolinas and in the 1670s where they set up shop in Charleston and then a little bit farther south in Port Royal in South Carolina, that this really, really uh, shakes up the Spanish presence there because for about a hundred years. So from 1565 to that moment of time, the Spanish have been the sole European power that has any sort of presence in the Southeast. So really this disrupts the opportunity of Native people trading and interacting with other European groups. And also there's a lot of Native people who have not warmed up to the Spanish. And so this is a new world that now is opening up to the Spanish, but against them. So Native people that have never warmed up to them are now joining or allying with the English. And this is trouble for the Spanish because not only have they've been unaccessible. Now they're enemies. So really, English presence changes everything. Part of me really hates saying that sentence because as someone who studies Spanish Florida, what I really wanted to show was how central Spanish Florida was and how Spanish Florida really was going to change everything. I didn't want to say English Carolina is so important. And lo and behold, all my sources from the 1660s on in Spanish Florida are writing about the English and how concerned they are. So I thought, oh no, in the end, the English do really matter. It changes everything. But actually, when you read the English sources, from the 1660s. They really are worried about the Spanish. So it's not just a one directional that South Carolina affects Florida. It's Florida deeply affects South Carolina. So these two European powers that are now competing in this space are really thinking of each other and thinking of the Native communities in between them as a way to figure out how to negotiate this space. The English did something the Spanish never could. They established trade networks with Native American peoples that stretched from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River and from present day Virginia south to Florida. Alejandra, how did the English accomplish this feat? Did they use information and communication networks differently from the Spanish? The English are, I mean, this is sort of, again, seems like a story we kind of already know because the English come there in much greater numbers and they come there ready to trade. This is something the Spanish have barely done. The Spanish establish a huge, really complex set of missions all through Florida. The English don't set up anything like that, but they do set up trade networks and they are trading not just European commodities in terms of sort of alcohol and cloth, they're trading guns. The gun trade really begins to reshape which native groups are willing to even engage with other European powers and what those arrangements are going to so this a whole new type of trade begins in South Carolina in which the enslavement of Native people that had always been a feature of the Southeastern Native groups, sort of the, the captivity taking of rival groups and bringing into society really just explodes because what ends up happening is Native groups start enslaving other Native groups and trading people for guns for the English. So what this does is creates a really complex and intricate network of relations and trade arrangements that are linking Native groups close to the coast to those farther away, to those even farther away that they're raiding and 
been attacking. And in terms of what this does for the Spanish and, and their native allies is it really exposes them to this world because the Spanish, even though they're witnessing this, they still refuse to trade any guns. So you have groups and mission Indians that are being exposed to native groups that were never warm to the Spanish that are now openly against them to have guns because they're trading with the English. And to get more guns or to pay their debts for their guns, they have to provide Indian slaves. So those slaves are going to be Spanish Indians or Indians that are in Spanish missions. By the late 17th and early 18th centuries, we have many different players in early North America, which means we have several different information networks, and each network passed information through different people. English traders, Spanish officials, runaway slaves, Indian agents, friars, messengers, diplomats, sailors, and planters. How did the messenger and recipient of news affect how information was conveyed and understood? This is a great question. And I, actually, when I began this many years ago, I was sort of thinking about the role of the particular informer and evaluating the informer. Does it matter if the messenger is a woman? Does it matter if the messenger is a 12-year-old boy? Does it matter if the messenger is a slave? Like, does the messenger itself and his persona or her persona affect the tone of the news? And so first, I was trying to categorize informers and classify what they were saying and the like. And I was finding out just a lot of people moving a lot of different types of information instead of a particular type or particular role of informant that was sort of developing much, much later in time. So in a way, of course, who delivers the news has an impact, right? Someone who is seen as a chief or someone who's seen as being more connected, perhaps their message is going to be better trusted. Someone who has eyewitness account to the situation is, of course, going to be valued more over someone who just heard something. That being said, this is what was striking to me is that there's a lot of, like you just said, a lot of different people moving a lot of different things. So that the trick was not to privilege one over the other. Other, but to learn how to process them all, process this huge array of different things and to make policy and make decision from this very different sorts of networks that are coming into play and that are connecting these spaces. It wasn't about privileging one particular group over another. It was about learning to make sense out of all of them. And of course, we need to talk about one more group in the region that also had its own information and communications network, African Slaves. Would you tell us about African Slave Networks? What sorts of information did they wish to obtain? And how did they use the information that came their way? This is exactly the story and the question that began this whole project. I wanted to know about the Stoner Rebellion. This is the largest slave rebellion that happens in colonial America. It happens in South Carolina in 1739. A group of slaves rebels against their masters in Stoner, South Carolina, and they march south. Because if they get to Spanish Florida, if they get to this place that's much closer than Virginia, if they march south, they're going to be free. Because the Spanish have an edict, they have a law in their book saying that if you're an African slave and you reach Spanish Florida and you promise to convert to Catholicism, you will be freed. And I thought, well, that's fantastic. How do these slaves know? How do they figure out? How do they figure out that Spanish Florida is free? Who's telling them? I have a sneaking suspicion it's not their masters that's saying to them, you know, if you march 250 miles south, you're going to be free. So if it's not that, you know, how are these people learning about this particular event? Of course, that doesn't get to your question, which is sort of about their own networks and their own connections. But that was much harder for me to gauge at. That's not an impossible project. In fact, I think there's a great one there that could continue being done. But I was more interested about how African slaves were taught into these existing networks and connections, how are they learning about these other activities, native groups, how are they learning about the Spanish, how are they learning about these edicts? And I think the answer is because they're plugging into these native networks. I mean, one of the most fascinating things that I found is that of the slaves that make it to Spanish Florida, there's moments and times in which African slaves are not able to reach St. Augustine. And part of that could just be, you know, bad luck, but also it's the inability of runaway slaves to reach Spanish Florida also comes at a time where particular native paths are not being kept up. And the moment those native paths are kept up, once again, African slaves are able to make it. So you see that they're not just tapped into their own community networks to figure out, you know, what's going on within the community. They're also tapping into this much larger world that's both native and European and plugging into it their own sort of bodies and their own ability to flee and escape. And in terms of the Spanish, they really are depending on runaway slaves as key informants. They see them as people who live in the English world, who know much more about the English than they ever will. They inhabit these spaces. They know a great deal about their decisions, why they do certain things, but also they're just important players because their physical presence away from English South Carolina, their brave choice to come there and to flee, it really destabilizes slavery. It's just the mere fact that they have a black informant, even though that person might not tell them the most relevant sort of timely news, the fact that they're physically there is enough of a disruption to the English that's an exciting enough informer to try to pursue and protect. 
We have a clearer idea of how information flowed through the early South and how Native Americans, Europeans, and enslaved Africans acquired and interpreted that information. But how does knowing all of this help us reconstruct what happened in the colonial South between the 16th and 18th centuries? So why does this matter? No, <laughs> I mean, but this is a great question. I think for me, this is a great story about thinking about many things, different levels of things. One of them, it makes you get on the ground. It makes you think about how do people know anything? How do they make choices about their lives? How do they exercise agency? And what does it all mean? And when we look at how those gears are turning, you begin to see just everyday interactions and articulations of power that not only sort of influence the everyday lives of these people, but really shape the contours of this region. So that for me in early America, it really sort of reshapes who matters in the early South and what actually is the early South and how it all functions. But that's for early America. In terms of information and sort of studying about just information in a different way, it's really exciting because stories of information tend to be about sort of absence of information, sort of colonial America was a place where no one knew anything and they operated with very limited news. Or it's a story about, well, they didn't know anything and then they got the printing press and then they got the mail system and then everything got better, sort of a technologically deterministic story in which getting more and more access to news somehow is going to make the story better, more democratic, more freer. And I was finding none of that. I was finding neither a complete absence nor technological deterministic story that new advances were going to change it. So it's really a story of information in which the main takeaway is neither of those things, but it's about people. It's about reinserting the role of humans in the creation and making of news. And I know that sounds really silly, but we often accredit lots of power and agency to news. We always say news News moves freely. Your information is blocked as if the act itself rather than the human carrying it is the thing that has the agency. And I think it's very important to remember the human role in that story. Because when we take it away, we not just sort of miss a great deal, but we then silence some of these fantastic voices that have made information be accessible or not. And those are sort of native and African voices that sort of get sort of lost otherwise. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the Spanish had not captured and ended the French settlement at Fort Caroline in 1565. How would the continued presence of the French in Florida have altered Spanish, English, Native American, and enslaved African relationships and communication networks? I think they would have fought for a very long time. I think if the French were still there, that would have created a lot of tensions between Native groups. I think missionization might have been much harder for the Spanish. And also, I just think English presence in South Carolina would have been greatly altered if they had to compete not just with the Spanish, but with the French. So that would have greatly sort of reshaped the story of the early American South for the English story. I don't think it would have establishing South Carolina wouldn't have been as easy or as straightforward. I think they would have met far more resistance. So I think it would have changed everything. <laughs> what aspect of history are you researching and writing about now? I'm beginning my own project on the War of Spanish Succession or Queen Anne's War. I'm sort of putting it out there. I'm very beginning. This is very early stages. I'm just seeing how the project develops. But I have two other projects I'm doing collaboratively, one with a linguist and one with sort of archaeology. And I'm really much enjoying really truly delving into other disciplines and thinking collaboratively and in, in, in very other disciplines. As I continue to be a, a me and potato historian, I also like to do these really insane collaborative projects and to challenge myself and learn a great deal. Where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how we can get in contact with you if we still have questions about information networks in the early South? I'm easy to find with a name like Alejandro Dubkowski. If you Google me, I come up. I'm, you can find me at the Yale Department of History webpage. I'm also on Twitter and I'm also on Facebook. So I'm, I'm everywhere if you want me to find and eager to answer any questions anyone might have. Alejandro Dubkowski, thank you for revealing how information traveled and was used throughout the early American South. My pleasure. The early American age of information helped transform the cultural and demographic landscape of the early South. When the Spanish received word that their French rivals had settled just north of San Agustin, they made war on the settlement. And when the English heard that the Spanish had discovered wealth in the Americas, they sought to establish their own colonies. They may have begun their settlement at Jamestown in New England, but they also settled in the early Southeast. And they did more than just settle. 
they used information gathered from reports about North America to establish a profitable and geographically extensive trade with Native American peoples. But how did Europeans learn what their rivals were up to? As Alejandra noted, it's not like they were sharing information with each other. At least in the early days of the colonial South, Europeans relied upon the information Native Americans gave them. But why did Native Americans share information with Europeans? Colonization had severe consequences for Native peoples. Disease and warfare decimated their populations. Trade changed the ways they worked and lived, and European land hunger displaced Native peoples from their lands. But as we can see from Alejandra's work, exchanging information seemed to be one way that Native peoples attempted to participate in and shape the changes Europeans initiated in North America. You can find information about Alejandra, her book, Informed Power, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 082. Don't forget to send me your interview questions. I want to make sure that episode 100 focuses on what you would like to know about history, the show, or my work as a historian. Send your questions to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our community on Facebook. All right, I'll see you next week for episode 83. But don't you want to know what aspect of early American history episode 83 will explore? I suppose it seems only fair that I provide you with a sneak peek as you are truly a hardcore fan if you're still listening. So next week, Jared Hardesty will take us through the everyday lives of the enslaved in colonial Boston. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.